Let's try it. I'm going to try. My king and my boss. I'm going to try to answer those three questions I said Disney would have when I came up with the option. Right? Remember the first was, why should we do it? And I said 65 basis points doesn't sound like much. So it's my job to make it real money. So I'm going to start with that. You know one way to think about the cost of capital? Right now, your entire business is being funded at that cost. That's the annual cost of running a business. It's kind of a, not a regular cost that shows up in your financials because a lot of this cost is an implied cost, the cost of equities in there. So right now, here's what you have. The value of Disney before they change their debt ratio, but the existing value of the business is 133.9 billion. Their cost of capital with their existing debt ratio is 7.81%. So if you multiply the 7.81 by the 133.9, right now it's costing them $10,458 million each year to run this business. What will happen if they go to the, the Optima? Well, the cost of capital is going to drop to 7.16%, only 65 basis points. That's going to reduce their cost to 9,592. They're going to save $866 million. You're still saying, that's not much money. It's a $133 billion company. That's each year. Their value as a company will change by the value of those savings over time. So here's what I did. I took the $866 million. I took the new cost of capital because that's going to be the discount rate for this cash flow. I assume that these savings will grow as the firm grows because I'm assuming the going concern. This is the present value of growing perpetuity we used yesterday. I'm just taking the present value of saving $866 million over time. And that value is $19.6 billion. So when I told you 65 basis points, who cares? $19.6 billion is a lot of money to leave on the table. That's almost 15% of the value of the company. Yeah? I think yeah. But if somehow your stockholders, they don't see the value of that. Kind of That's true of everything, right? So in a sense, whether the price will react or not. So the question I ask is a different one. If I do this, will my value as a company go up by 19.6 billion? You know exactly the answer I'm going to tell you. There are 60 million people walking around thinking Elvis is still alive. Right? But you need to do your work. So in a sense, if you cook the books and the number. So I'll tell you what the history of recaps has been in the US. A typical recap causes the stock price to rise by between 15 to 20 percent. So at least on the face of it, stockholders see the benefit. And the way it shows up is very concrete. What's happening? You borrow money and you buy back shares, right? So what happens when the number of shares are outstanding? It shrinks. It shows up. And most investors might not do the math, but they can think in earnings per share numbers. And say, hey, that's good for me. So for better or worse, I think a lot of bad buybacks are sold with earnings per share numbers. In this case, I hope there's something more than just a per share adjustment that's driving up the value. So that's the first stop. Will it convince managers? Maybe, maybe not. But the hook is in. If you do this, your value will increase by roughly 20 billion. Then you come to the second question. And this any prudent management team should take. What if something goes wrong? The easiest way to answer this question is to look at what can go wrong. Because what can go wrong in a company will vary across companies. We are a big, stable company in a solid business. A bad year for you might be a 5% drop in operating income. If you're a technology company, think of how quickly BlackBerry went from hero to zero, or close to zero. You, bad year for you might be a 50% drop in operating income. So what can go wrong often requires that you look at the company, look at its history, you look at what a bad year looks like for that company. And that's what I tried for Disney. I went back and I looked at the operating income going back to 1987. I just want to see what's a really bad year. And over that 26 year period, the worst year that Disney had was a drop in operating income of about 29% in 2000. I didn't know bottom fell out that year. Whatever happened, that was a really bad year. So here's what I can do to see if my analysis is robust. I used the operating income from 2013 to come up with the optimal of 40%, right? So I said, well, let me look at what a drop will do. So if I hold everything that's constant, drop it 10%, 20%, 30%, let's see what happens to the optimal. We know kind of what will happen. As my operating income drops, my optimal will come down. I just want to know whether it drops from 40 to 10 with a 10% drop or whether it stays up there. And at least in the context of Disney, there was some good news. 
I had to drop the operating income by 30% or more before my optimal debt ratio changed. What is the worst year they've had in the last 26? 29%. So I could take the worst year. And I, so I do this on companies because sometimes you get a result saying, maybe you shouldn't borrow money. There's not enough buffer. In this case, at least for Disney, there is enough buffer left in this process that even if they have a bad year, they will have no problem servicing that. This is really driven by what you have as earnings and cash flows, and I feel comfortable with your borrowing money. And this is where when you do a commodity or a cyclical company, you might hold back, right? Because when you do the what ifs there, and you say, what happens if the cycle changes, you could very quickly decide that the 40 is too high and that you have to settle for 20. That's a management decision, right? Because Ultimately, it's all management decisions, right? No, I mean, but you would consider... Oh, how much buffer to bring? Oh. Yeah. So that's, I think, ultimately left to manage. If you're an aggressive manager, you say, I might not need much buffer, so where you go will be a management decision. <coughs> but right. your job is then Just to give them the cost, actually, right. of that. In fact, there are two ways this process plays out. One is to do this operating income and change it and see what happens to the optimal. The other is, I forgot to tell you what the rating I gave Disney at 40% was, right? I won't tell you up front, but what if I told you it was double B? <coughs> Would you be willing to go to a 40% debt ratio? No. Yeah? Because you have a constraint. And for many US companies, that constraint is at least an investment grade. Right. right? And some buffer. And some buffer. Maybe you want to be uh, A minus rather than a triple B. So let me ask you that question. When we talk about rating constraints, what is so magical about having an investment grade? Why do companies feel so reluctant to drop the loan? <coughs> The first is that at least until very recently, if you drop below investment grade, you lost access to capital markets. In fact, pre-19, early 1980s, if you drop below investment grade, your access to the bond market was shut off. You say, what happened in the 80s? Well, you got Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham in the junk bond market. And the essence of the junk bond market is he opened up at least the possibility that you could be below investment grade and still borrow money. So the first thing you worry about is access to capital and you don't want to drop below those magic price. The other thing is the day after you drop, and Brazil went through this a little bit a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the day you draw, get dropped from investment grade to below investment grade, you see a news story, right? Wall Street Journal, local papers. Drop below investment grade. You think, so what? Who's reading those stories? Your customers, your suppliers, your employees, right? We talked about that indirect bankruptcy costs. So the other thing you worry about is that spiral effect, that this is going to start to... So you, so I understand when people, when a company says, look, I don't want to drop below investment grade. But once in a while you'll have a CEO who says, I want to be a AAA rated company at any cost. Rise to the challenge. Give them the bill. And here's how you can do it. In the case of Disney, they're rating at the optimal was a single A, which I think is okay. I can live with that. But let's say managers at Disney came in and said, we want a double A rating. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go into the spreadsheet to look, see, to look to see how far I can push their debt ratio without dropping it below double A. And they're optimal with a double A rating. And this is like a constrained optimal. If you've ever done optimization, <laughs> it's going to be lower than four, it's 30%. I value the company at 30% and I compare it to the 40%. The difference I get, is $5.7 billion. So if you really pushed and said, I want a double A rating, I'd say, okay, it'll cost you five, it'll actually cost your stockholders $5.7 billion. Go explain it to them. And if they wanted a triple A rating, the cost rises to 12 billion. The cost of a big ego. Because this is, in many, in many companies, this is bragging rights. I'm a triple A rated company, to which my response is, big deal. What does it accomplish no? if you're destroying value, of leaving value on the table? So that is, that, that is the cost over what period of time? It is uh, over in, in perpetuity. I'm valuing your business as a going concern. So if you go to AAA at any cost, what I'm effectively saying is you're, you're losing that tax subsidy, not just this year, but, but forever, <coughs> through time. Infinity. Exactly. For the life of your company, I'm saying, so this is a long-term decision you're making. You say, I'm going to be AAA rated instead of AA rated. I'm saying, okay, let me work through the consequences of this in the long term for you. And your value is lower by $12 billion. Okay. I remember talking to the CEO of 
a steel company in Europe, a long time ago, last AAA rated steel company in the world at that time. And I asked him, what's this fixation you have about the AAA rating? He said, that's easy. I can borrow money at a much lower rate because I'm AAA. I said, how exactly do you preserve your AAA rating? <laughs> By never borrowing money. This is the kind of circular logic that gets us into trouble. If the only way you preserve the power to borrow money at a really low rate is to never borrow money, what exactly is being accomplished? And with many companies with these really, really high investment grades or ratings, that's the way they maintain this. They never borrow money. I'll give you the cynical side too. That 19 billion in value I created by going to a 40% optimal. Remember for Disney? Where did it come from? I'm taking the same projects, same theme parks, same movies. You know where it's coming from? Taxpayers. And that is one reason why we end up with an economy where the only way value is created for shareholders is by changing capital structure. At the economy-wide level, what's happening? There's no value being created. You're just moving money around. And perhaps that is the most worrisome thing about the U.S. economy over the last 30 years is how much that when people talk about financial buyers, stripped down to basics, many of these LBO guys are so, that's the only thing they need know how to do. They need know how to change the capital structure. And I remember being on a panel where when one of these LBO guys got up and talked about how much value they were creating for the economy. And I was going after him, which was lucky. I said, where? You're not creating value for the economy. Get your ego under control. All you're doing is transferring value from taxpayers to yourself. I'm not going to stop you. You're doing what's legal. I, you're entitled to do it. But don't strut around acting like you're creating value. Because to create value, you have to change the asset side of the balance sheet. <coughs> Deal with the final question. So why should we do it 19 <coughs> billion? What if something goes wrong, you got enough of a buffer? So here comes the final question. Disney says we have all these big plans. We want to take prod we want to build that Shanghai theme park. It's going to cost us money. We'd like to make Star Wars 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever. It'll cost us money. You've told us we have excess debt capacity. This seems like a marriage made in heaven, right? You've excess debt capacity, you have great projects, why can't I take them? So the question you might ask is: will my optimal be different? Hmm, the optimal is 40%. If instead of buying back stock, I expanded my business. I'll give you the easy answer first and I'll give you the difficult answer later. The easy answer is your optimal will stay unchanged if you stay in the same business and you just expand it. You say, what does that mean? Maybe yesterday I had a breakdown of Disney, 49% broadcasting, 36%. So if you are in a sense just expanding your business, I'm going to assume your cash flows will expand proportionately. And say, so you know what? It's okay, you can keep the 40%. But what if Disney said they'd like to borrow the money and buy Twitter? They can't buy Twitter, 39 billion, then yeah, they can buy Twitter. Then what, what do you think is going to happen to the optimal? Is it going to be lower than 40, higher than 40? <laughs> and tell me why. It's going to be lower than 40, tell me why. It's first you're buying the risky business, what kind of cash flows? Negative cash flows. You buy a risky business with negative cash flows, you put that into the mix, your optimal is going to go down. This is why you cannot give managers blank checks with debt capacity. You don't even buy blank checks. You have debt capacity. Do whatever you want. And they will. If you are going to do something, I need to know what you're going to be doing for me to tell you what the debt ratio will look like after you do it. So it's a very flexible approach as long as you realize what you've computed and how it might change as you bring in new, new things to the game. One question. Yep. How sensitive is this calculation to the cost of uh, debt because of the I'll tell you what it's sensitive rates. to. In fact, I'll show you a, gra a graph. It's not the cost of debt that the matters. Of interest rates, so uh, it, it's a default <laughs> spread, but it's not the default spread by itself, but it's the default spread relative to something else. So I'll show you what the number is that drives whether you should borrow money or use equity. But that's a graph that I'll show you in a minute. Before I do that though, very quickly, let me do the optimal for my other companies. Each one I'll tell you the kind of issues I ran into. When I looked at Vale's optimal debt ratio, and I plugged in the numbers, you know, the optimal debt ratio I got was 30%. And if I'll remind you, Vale was already at 39% <coughs> debt at this time. So this was with 2013 income. 
And I actually talked to the CFO of Bali right after it. I said, you guys seem a little over levered. And his response was, iron ore prices are down and they're going to rebound. Rebound to what? A 10-year average. And the 10-year average was actually much higher. If you use the 10-year average, you actually come up with an optimal of 50%. Yeah, actually, I don't blame it because people when they normalize usually use 10 years. You know what the problem with that 10-year average was? China. China has destroyed every single... You look at every commodity graph. No? Oil, you look at iron ore, you look at any commodity. Here's what you see. 1890 through 2003, it goes... And then you have this China spike. And you've got 10 years where iron ore prices are suddenly at 100. You know what the inflation adjusted average oil price over the last 75 years is? It's about $40 a barrel. That's an inflation adjusted average oil price. 27 is lower than that average, but if you think it's going to bounce back to 80 or 100 or 120, your vision of oil average is being skewed by China. So with the commodity company or cyclical company, whether you like it or not, your views on commodity prices affect how much you borrow. And if those views in hindsight happen to be wrong, guess what? You're screwed. And 60% of the commodity space is in serious trouble. In fact, next week I'm going to do a blog post where I'm going to take every commodity company, I'm going to compute the debt ratio and the coverage ratios just to see how much potential damage there is on the horizon if oil prices stay at 27 or 30 or even $35 a barrel. There's a whole boatload of pain coming at us on the commodity space that we haven't even thought through yet. Okay. Doesn't mean that Exxon Mobil is going to go bankrupt. They have no debt. But there's a whole, I mean, you, you can take, you know, the 70% of oil commodity companies that borrowed on a normalized price. And they thought they were doing the sensible thing. They're now they're going to discover that what they thought was normal was not. Then I tried Baidu. The optimal debt ratio for Baidu was about 5%. I said, why is it so low? Makes money. What's a debt ratio? It's a so I take the value of your company and I go to 10%, 20%. So if you're a high growth firm, remember the growth assets and assets in place? As a market, I reward you with this high value. If you're Facebook or Google or Baidu or whatever other company, right? So I give you a big value. 10% of that big value is a big debt number. What do I have to service that debt number with? Cash flows from existing assets. Remember I said three of the companies in this class, well, you'll end up with an optimal of 0%. They happen to be the highest growth companies. They're not bad companies. They just can't afford to borrow money because they don't have the earnings and cash flows from existing businesses to go out and borrow money. So Baidu, because it's a younger, higher growth company, it's optimal debt ratio. is going to be much lower. Debt ratio to cash flows. The, it's, I don't understand. I know people talk about debt to EBITDA. This, I don't like that, to be quite honest. I prefer looking at debt to operating income. I'll tell you, the only difference is debt to EBITDA. I look at debt to EBIT. That's basically what I'm looking at. The reason I don't like to look at EBITDA is what kinds of companies have low EBIT and high EBITDA? It's very, very simple. So don't think too long. What has to be true about the company? To get from low EBIT to high EBITDA? It's got to have lots of da. How do you have lots of da? You have lots of capex. Now do you see why this debt to EBITDA can get you into trouble? You borrow money because you have a lot of EBITDA. So that's my cash flow. Those companies are infrastructure companies. They need a lot of capex. That da is not there for you to, it's not supposed to be used to service debt. So mine is actually a debt to EBIT. That's indirectly what I'm doing. Because I want to make sure your operating income as a going concern is enough to, because if you're using depreciation to cover debt payments, you're digging a hole for yourself. You can do it one year, two years, but you can't do it continuously. So it's a very close relationship, but it's, you know, it's, I, I prefer the habit to the habit. Yes? Are you going to talk about the target um, debt acceleration? Let me ask you a question. If, if you've been around analysts often enough, they'll start using words like a target debt ratio. Where did that number come from? Usually it is a, it's the other approach I'm going to talk about, which oh, is, tra is, is about so that's all it is. It's target debt ratios often is looking at the average for the sector and saying that's where we need to be. So I'm going to talk about what the draw is of this sector. Okay. 
and why it's going to get us all into trouble because what we're going to do is collectively screw up. That's basically what this does. In fact, a lot of the commodity companies, why do they borrow money? Because everybody else is borrowing money. So it's kind of a <coughs> me too, I call this the me too approach to corporate finance. And I have some bad news. 90% of corporate finance is me too. Why are you taking those projects? Everybody else, me too. Why are you borrowing money? Everybody else is borrowing, me too. Why are you paying dividends? Everybody's paying dividends, me too. And Me Too corporate finance classes last 15 minutes. Because <laughs> what do you need in a Me Too class? Look at everybody else. Look at what they're doing. Do what they're doing. And if you screw up? At least you're not alone. Exactly. You're always going to have lots of time. Survival will push you towards Me Too corporate finance even if you're well-intentioned. And I, and I understand it. So I'm going to give you the Me Too aspect because when I sell an optimal debt solution to a company. <coughs> At the end of the discussion, you know what the CFO is going to ask me? If I do this, will I look strange? You know what he's talking about? <laughs> is this an analyst who's going to compare my debt ratio to these 15 other entertainment companies and I have to give him the ammunition to be able to deal with that analyst and explain to that analyst why Disney should be able to borrow more money than the typical entertainment company. I view that as part of what I need to do to get somebody to accept the solution is the optimal solution. So then I tried the optimal debt ratio of a bookscape. Remind me again what bookscape is? A privately owned bookstore. And this lady has her entire wealth tied up in it, right? But private businesses ha can borrow money as well. I used exactly the same approach. The one con difference was instead of using my market beta, I use the total data, which means that this lady is exposed to all risk and that's going to magnify she borrows money. Her optimal debt ratio was 30% debt. She was actually at a 28% debt ratio with lease commitments. Okay. No, so you know what? You're close enough. Let's suppose it had been only 2% debt. And I said, you, you have debt capacity. And she, she says, look, and I, I don't like to borrow money. It makes me sick. It gives me ulcers. You know what my response would be? This is your private business. You don't want to borrow. Don't borrow money. Unlike a CFO of a public company where you can't use that excuse. <coughs> private businesses, I cut slack. I cut slack because it's the owner's money. I don't want this guy to die of a heart attack because he borrowed money and he worried about it every night for the next 15 years. So if private business owners say, look, I don't feel comfortable borrowing money, a step back, that's it. But it's good for them to know they have debt capacity in case they want to draw on it to be able to do things that they otherwise couldn't do. Yes, Thomas? If you use the market beta, would the optimal debt be lower or higher? It is slightly higher because what happens is the magnifying effect, what happens here is the cost of equity effect. <coughs> the cost of equity magnifies so quickly that it kind of overwhelms. So private firms generally should borrow less money than public companies. And if you have unlimited liability thrown into the mix, you know what I mean by unlimited liability. They can come after your house, your car, then you'll become even more wary about what you do. So use of a total beta will usually push your optimal down. Can you generalize? Seller is paribus, higher beta, lower optimal debt? Higher unlevered beta, yeah. Yeah. lower debt ratio. The more business, it's actually a very common sense proposition, right? The more business risk you have, please don't magnify it with, by, 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 by borrowing money on that business risk. That's absolutely true. Now let's talk about whether we can do this for a bank. Remember what I said yesterday? Debt for a bank is not a source of capital. It's raw material. But banks have to decide whether they can pay dividends or whether they need to raise fresh equity. And here my focus is going to change. Let me give you a very simplistic example. Let's think of an old-fashioned bank. You know what an old-fashioned bank does? It collects deposits, pays an interest rate on the deposits, lends the money out at a higher rate, makes money off the spread. Let's assume that this bank has made $100 million in loans. So these are its assets, the loans it's made. And let's say it faces a regulatory requirement that it has to maintain 5% of that loan base as regulatory capital. $5 million. This bank right now has a regulatory capital of $6 million, so it's above the minimum. But this bank is run by a very conservative <coughs> management team, and they say, look, we want to have, by the end of next year, 
a ratio of 7%. So we'd like to increase it 7%. You're mm-hmm. saying, why if the regulatory minimum is 5% or do you want to push the other direction? Mm-hmm. Hey, the regulatory minimum is a floor. You know your business better than the regulator does, and you're saying, I'm making some risk. <coughs> so you want to get to 7%, but you're growing back. <coughs> so let's say you expect to increase the loans you grant by 50% next year. So let's work out the math. At the end of next year, how much will you have in loans outstanding? You're going to have 150 million, right? You want to have 7% of that 150 million in regulatory capital slash equity. So that's 10.5 million. Right now you're at 6 million, so you've got to come up with 4.5 million. So what's the first place you start to look for the money? You make net income, right? So let's say you make 5 million in net income. Do I, can I add the 5 million to your 6 million? It's net of dividends. So if you pay, take the 5 million, and you, so you can already see how much I can pay in dividends is already determined, right? So if I have 5 million in net income, and I need to increase my equity base by 4.5 million, I need to keep my dividends. But here's where the me tooism kicks in. What if every other bank is paying out 50% of its earnings as dividends? Then you pay, and you now have a hole. And what do you need to fill up the hole? You need to issue equity. This is the kind of insanity that drives financial service companies. Is they get locked into dividend policies that they can't afford, especially post-2008 when you've got regulatory capital shortfalls. So one window you're paying out dividends, the other window you're raising equity, just to keep in steady state. I understand why they do it, but I have to factor that in. So when a bank thinks about capital structure decisions, they're thinking about how much new equity will I need to issue, how much can I afford to pay in dividends, and the regulatory capital becomes a lever you use to answer both those questions. So don't think in terms of cost to capital or optimal debt ratios for banks. It really makes no sense. Just focus on equity, regulatory equity. It's amazing how much of what banks have to do. Incidentally, in the U.S., if you are a TARP bank, the bank, one of the banks that actually got help from the federal government after 2008, you can no longer pay dividends on your own. You got to get the Fed to approve it. You know what the Fed looks at? Looks at this number. So when you say, I'd like to pay two and a half million dollars in dividends this year out of the five million in income, the Fed checks your numbers and say, you know what? It looks like you will have to, you know, raise about two million. We're not going to approve. This is too big a dividend. City actually was prevented from buying back stock a year ago precisely for this reason. So, so it's actually become almost formalized in the process. That's why I said banks, increasingly, it's like you talk about straight jackets, the straight jacket's getting tighter and tighter with each you know, continuing year new rules coming into play. So now think, let's think about why the optimum varies across companies. So I took all five, five of my companies and I held everything else constant. And this, goes, this is going to be in response to Rahul's question about, hey, wouldn't it make sense for me to borrow just because debt is cheaper than equity? I kept everything else constant, and I changed the tax rate from 40 to 30 to 20 to 10 to 0. <coughs> At 0 percent, what's your optimal debt ratio for every company? Zero. Why would companies still continue to borrow? Either because you have constraints on raising equity, or because your equity markets are not developed. The, when I was in Dubai, I actually picked 10 Middle Eastern companies and I asked people to do the optimal capital structure for all 10. Every, every group came back and said, none of these companies should be borrowing money. And they all do. So I said, how come? There's no tax benefit to debt. Why do they borrow money? And one by one, the reasons came out. This company is run by a family that will not issue equity. Okay, now I understand why you borrow money. Oh, this company is in Oman and the capital markets are not developed. They can't get to the market with a new issue. This company is a private company. They have no access to equity capital. If you borrow money, then you're doing it because there's some constraint in the capital process. That So be at least be clear about why you borrow money. This is not making you a more valuable company. You're doing it because if you had the luxury of access to equity, you would use it. But you have other things that are kind of keeping you pinned in. Yeah. Just one question. Yeah. When you say it's zero, yeah. uh, if I borrow something, am I destroying value or am I just not? It adding? depends on how much default risk there is. Because if you don't get the tax, so think about the framework, right? If I take the tax benefits out, mm-hmm. there's actually very little on the plus side of the yeah, equation. Yeah. So if, you have, if you're very close to zero default, 
then you're like in the Milo Modigliani world. But how many companies are there? So if you're a very large company with lots of cash flows, too big to fail, the government will bail you out, then you might say I'd borrow money even. And that could actually answer the question, why an Aramco might borrow money? Because it's obviously too big to fail. And of course, if it fails, it takes Saudi Arabia down with it. No. But that's it. But then there's a trade-off on the, on the when we, we say that when you bring the, the loan, yeah. we have kind of get in a straight jacket, but when you issue equity, you also get other people to come and... But it's still a residual claim, right? So in a sense, a straitjacket is a contractual straitjacket yeah, yeah. with debt. With equity, it's a self-imposed straitjacket, right? So if you push yourself out of the straitjacket, you're not going to go to jail. Yeah. But debt, this is actually a contractual obligation. There's a huge difference. Now, even though initially you might feel it's not, a, no, not that much, you will feel it when you're in trouble. Glencore right now wishes we're in an equity straitjacket, not a debt straitjacket. Second, and this goes back to what is it that drives optimal, it's how much cash flow you generate as a firm as a percentage of your value as a company. So let me, let me illustrate. Facebook last year had cash flows of about $5 billion. That's a lot of cash, right? But the market cap was $200 billion. 5 divided by $200 billion is 2.5%. Exxon Mobil had cash flows of about $30 billion on a market cap of 250 billion. As a, so it's not just the cash flow, but how big it is relative to the value of the firm. Because the more cash flows you generate as a percentage of the value, the more you can afford to borrow. In fact, a lot of LBO participants use a multiple of EBIT. They look at the EBITDA relative to the enterprise value, simply to see, well, how much cash is this company throwing off so I can service the debt? You can see why. Debt should be driven by cash flows. Not value. That's why you can have a very valuable firm that can't borrow money. And you can have a firm that doesn't look as valuable, borrow a lot more money. It's entirely driven by cash flows and where you're in the life cycle. Third factor is somebody already guessed this. Thomas, I think, brought this up. The unlevered beta matters. The higher the unlevered beta for your business, the more wary you should be about borrowing money because everything starts to get magnified very quickly. It's a very risky business. Do the common sense thing. The last thing you want to do is add to your risk by for money. And now the final question, this goes to Tiago's point. See this black line here? That's actually the default spread on a BAA rated bond. So basically it captures the level of default <coughs> spreads in the bond market. So when you borrow money, that drives your cost of debt, right? The risk-free rate plus the default spread. What drives the cost of equity? Risk-free rate plus beta times an equity risk premium. So the second line, the blue line, is actually the implied equity risk premium I computed Day, day before yesterday. So, it's, uh, so when this number, when, when you see a high number here, the price of risk in the equity market is high, and when the number drops off, the price of risk is low. So you're a CFO. You have two choices, right? You can borrow money or raise equity. When you borrow money, you pay the price of risk in the bond market, which is the default risk. When you raise equity, you pay the price of risk in the equity market, which is the equity risk premium. Most of the time, the two move together, except when they don't. <laughs> Let me take two periods in the last 20 years where the two have moved in different directions and the consequences have been huge. First take the 1990s. What's happening? Default spread stays high, equity risk premiums drop, drop, drop. In fact, by the end of 1999, the equity risk premium was 2% and the default spread in the BAA, which is a very safe bond, was also 2%. So you're a CFO of a company, you're thinking about how to raise money in 1999. <coughs> The equity market is charging almost nothing for risk. So you can get this really high price, even if you're a risky company. The bond market is charging you what it typically has. So where are you going to go raise money? 99? You're going to raise equity like it's going out of stock. Well, all those telecom companies raising stock, even though they had no use for it. That, of course, was at the core of the dot-com boom and bust. We made equity too cheap. Boom bust. And what did people say? Never again will we let something like this happen. Famous last words. Then you 9-11. And what Alan Greenspan said right after 9-11 was he would not let the US economy go into recession. The hubris of central bankers. And what did he do? He basically pumped in the bond market. 
the way it manifested itself is look at what happened between 2001 and 2007. Bond default spreads are dropping like a rock. The price of risk in the bond market is going lower and lower. The price of equity risk is staying high. So in 2006, if you are a CFO saying, where should I go to raise money? Guess what you were doing? You were borrowing money like it was going out of style because bankers were not charging you a high enough spread to cover the default risk. In fact, you take it down the layers. This is a subprime problem right there, right? This, as I said at the start of the day before yesterday, the subprime problem was, wasn't just that you were lending to people with bad credit risk, you were lending at too low a rate. And it wasn't just the subprime, the entire debt market had that problem. And of course, in 2008, that blew up. There are very few market crises where the bond market is a precipitating factor. It's usually the equity guys who go crazy. 2008 was a bond market crisis that blew up and took the equity market down with it. So look at what happened in 2008. The numbers converge. And then you start moving in. This year, as you saw, default spreads are start during the last year have started to rise again. But equity risk premiums didn't change much until the last 18 days. So maybe what, what we're getting is the other shoe dropping now, saying, oh my God, look at what I can earn in the bond market. I can earn 4% more than the risk-free rate investing in a BAA rated bond. So there, you know, one of the problems we have in finance is we've all become so specialized. You walk in any investment by the, the equity guys. In fact, it's what? They're not just the equity guys, the emerging equity, the Brazil equity guys, they all are in their little silos. And they compare themselves to each other. They say, nothing's wrong here. We're all doing the same thing. It's what we almost need is, you know, when, when I first started working with investment banks in the early 80s, we had people, what I, uh, people that I called renaissance people. They knew a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They, so they, they could do a 20 different things. They kept, you know, so they might not have been very good at any, but they, there were a few people around who had that big, but it'd be, it's amazing how few of those people I run into now. Everybody's a specialist. It's like being in healthcare, right? You have a knee problem, you go and there's a knee specialist. All he does is look at knees. He doesn't even realize there's the rest of the body. <coughs> the knee, that's all that matters. If I fix your knee, in the process he kills the rest of you. He says, you have a really good knee. Well, you died. <laughs> that's in a sense what's happening in finance is people have become so specialized that they've lost perspective, which opens up the door for big picture perspectives. So some of the macro, not all of the macro investing, is really saying, look, and I'm going to step back and look at the big picture to see what's cheap, what's expensive, and what I can play on. So when you get a chance, go to the capital structure spreadsheet that I have linked up in yours, and it's also in the shared drive. Enter the numbers. This is a 10-minute exercise. So you can do it. Actually, do it while it's fresh. Don't wait till three weeks from now because I have no idea what, I, what we did in class. Do it as soon as you... Maybe on the plane back. The flight back. A long flight, right? You might be stuck on the <laughs> runway for like seven hours. So charge your laptop. Have a backup battery. You know, make sure you have an outlet next to you. Kill the passenger next to you if need be to get to an outlet. Because you have a lot of time to work. Maybe you can finish the entire project on your way home. Plug the numbers and see what your optimal is. And, but it's not the number that I'm looking for. So uh, what I want in your report is not that the optimal debt ratio is 40% with my own spreadsheet fed back to me. I want you to tell me why your company has the optimal that it is. Why is it high? Why is it low? Why is it in the middle? And what the company should do. This is not just a number crunching. Anybody can come up with the optimal for a company. I want you to tell me a story about what to do with that optimal in your company. Now let's talk about the other way in which I could have done this. I could have looked at everybody else around me and said, what did they do? What did they do? They don't borrow money. I'm going to go to borrow money. I remember when my youngest was about six, he came back from school one day. And he did something he shouldn't have done. I don't even remember what it was. So I asked him, Kieran, why would you do something like that? He said, Dad, everybody else was doing it. And of course, his mom jumps in with a classic mom response to that, which is, if everybody else jumped off the bridge, would you jump off the bridge too? Everybody's mother has had that response. <laughs> and he, like any six-year-old, says, of course, mom, do you want me to look strange? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you get that same response when you talk to CFOs. Why do you do that? Everybody else is doing it. 
but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter. So in capital structure, there's almost this magnetic pull towards averages. So if you're in a sector where everybody borrows a lot of money, you feel almost <laughs> like an outsider until you do what they do. So I don't try to push back. I recognize this is human nature. And I, I blame analysts just as much for this, because equity research analysts are just as lazy, right? How do they decide whether a company has too much debt? They just look at debt ratios across and say, oh, you have the highest number in that table. So here's all I can do for them. I said, look, when you look different from the rest of the sector and you're doing the right thing, let's say your optimal says you should have only 10%, everybody else has 50%, then I need to give you the ammunition to be able to at least justify why you should borrow less. And that ammunition might be that you're in a riskier business than everybody else. Maybe you're a retailer, but you're in this niche business where everything can change. Maybe it's because of the fact that you have a much higher tax rate or, or a much lower tax rate than everybody else. Maybe that. So maybe you're the one company. If you're Ryanair, you're going to look strange relative to other airlines if I just compare your debt ratios. But you should. You have lower tax rates. So I'm going to try to go back to that trade-off again and see if there's something in that trade-off that can allow me to explain why you have to be at a debt ratio different from the rest of the sector. Will it work? Maybe it will, maybe it will not. Maybe those analysts are so set in their ways that they would still push against you. But at least you try. So here's what I did. I took my four companies and I got incredibly lucky. Let me explain what I mean by incredibly lucky. Remember for Disney, their existing debt ratio is 11.6. I told them their optimal was 40%, right? That came from that cost to capital approach. I pulled up the averages and you see what I mean by lucky? I can now back it up by saying, if you do this, move from where you are to the optimal, not only would you be doing the right thing intrinsically, you're actually moving closer to the average of the sector. You right now have less debt than the typical company in the sector. So this actually reinforces my recommendation by saying, if you move towards the optimal, you are in fact moving towards the sector. You are under levered, not just on a cost of capital basis, but relative to the sector. I took Vale. I found them to be over level. When I compare them to the, uh, the industry average, it reinforces the fact again, you have too much debt, not just on my cost of capital basis, but if I compare you to the sector. With Tata Motors, I found them to be over level. And here I think there's an interesting phenomenon at play. I actually did, when I did Tata Motors, I also did Tata Steel, Tata Chemicals, and TCS, four big Tata companies. And here's what I found. Tata Motors, Tata Steel, and Tata Chemicals all had too much debt, often to do big acquisitions. Tata Consulting Services had no debt, even though it could afford to carry a lot of debt. You think, so what, the four separate companies, are they? Your Tata Motors, you go into a bank in Mumbai to borrow money. The banker is lending based on your financials, but what else is he looking at? He's saying, you know what, if you get into trouble, the family group is, it seems to me, and, and maybe I'm being cynical, that Tata Steel, Tata Chemicals, and Tata Motors are all borrowing against Tata Consulting Services indirectly. You think, so what? If I'm a Tata Consulting Services stockholder, I'm really pissed off. You see why? This is not like, gee, I'm getting the whole company, I'm getting a slice. You're taking my debt capacity, because I buy shares in Tata Consulting Services, and you're using another company's new group, and there's not a thing I can do about it. It's the nature of family group companies. And I warned you up front that this would happen as you started looking at these companies. And finally, I looked at Baidu, which has very little debt on a market basis. And it's in a sector. But there's no debt. In fact, I, would, I did both gross debt and net debt ratios. So you could see whether this phenomenon was. So that what if analysis is something you do just to see if, in fact, you can reinforce. Your toughest sales pitches are when you're trying to get a company to borrow money in a sector where nobody else borrows money. Then you, go, then you have to fight far bigger battles along the way. And you might lose. You, know, you just have to accept the fact that all you can do is present the facts, and those managers will still decide. So once you get the optimal for your company this evening at 7 o'clock on the plane, then you have a question to ask. Okay? At this stage, one of three things is going to be true. Either your company is where those very unusual companies that's right at its optimal. In which case, what should you do? Remember the Hippocratic oath. Do no harm. 
What I mean by that is often when, pe when, when consultants are called into companies, they feel this urge. They have to say something. You call me in, but what if everything the company is doing is right? Just tell them you're doing everything right, but then they're not going to pay you. So you feel this urge to. So what I'm saying is if you get the optimal, don't feel this urge to do things just for the sake of doing things. Just tell me. They're pouring the right amount. Let me move on to the next section of the project. But for most of you, one of two things is going to be true. Either your company has too little debt or has too much debt. Either is a bit of a problem. Your follow-up question then has to be, how quickly do I need to deal with this problem? If you have too little debt, what do you worry about? Potentially, you might be taken over by somebody who might access your debt, but that depends on what kind of anti-takeover restrictions you have, corporate governance. But what you worry, with too little debt, you worry about, hey, somebody else might use this debt capacity to buy me. With too much debt, what do you worry about? What's the hanging over your head? You could go bankruptcy. If you're going to have a company with a problem, which would you rather have them have? Too little debt or too much debt? <coughs> Pray and hope too little. Much, much, much nicer problem to have. But beggars can't be choosers. You're in the commodity space right now? You're running to <coughs> far more companies with too much debt than too little debt. So I have this little picture I use to kind of talk about what to do next. Yeah? You have statistics on, on your 41,000 companies in terms of over and under, under I don't. I can't do the optimal for all of them because I have to go through the spreadsheet. But it's actually very simple. I can do ratios like debt to EBIT. You, you can very, in fact, that's going to be my next post. I've done a series of five posts on the data. The most recent one looked at returns. The next one's going to look at capital structure. I'm going to look at it across sectors, across companies, and across regions. Because I think that, so the obvious things are going to come out. Commodity companies are over levered, but you're probably going to find layers that are being created of other sectors that are being sucked into the space. Steel companies. Why? Because, you know, it's the same China phenomenon playing out. So I, I am going to put, that's going to be my next post. Probably by early next week, you should see that on my blog. So here's what I do. Right? You've done the analysis. You compare the actual to the optimal. Let's take the, the nicer problem first. Your company is too little debt. You have too little debt, here's what I worry about. Are you the potential target of a hostile acquisition? Why would having too little debt again, remind me in practical terms, how having too little debt makes it easy? So you can think like an acquirer. How does the fact that I have too little debt make it easier for you to acquire me? You can, yeah, but this is kind of a practical problem, right? In fact, let me give you an analogy and you can see whether, you know, why your job might be easier than mine. Let's assume you buy a house in the New York area. It's going to cost you a million dollars, even with housing prices lower than they were in 2007. Let's say you borrow $800,000 and you buy the house. And then you save like crazy. You're really frugal. Every penny, every dollar, every $100. And over five years, you pay off the entire loan. You now own the only all-equity financed house in the neighborhood. <laughs> You decide to have a mortgage burning party. You heard of this? In the old days in the US, people would take these 30 year mortgage loans, and on the last loan payment, they would call all their neighbors over and give them orange juice and cookies, and, and they would burn, physically burn. Once in a while, they'd burn the house down with the mortgage, you know? but they'd burn the mortgage papers. So you decide to have a mortgage burning party, but you decide to be safe. You have extinguishers, firemen, everybody's invited. So all your neighbors are around. And they toast you, except for your neighbor Bob, who's never liked you, he doesn't like the shrubs you picked, he doesn't like the way you cut your lawn, he hates your kids. But he comes anyway, it's free food. And while he's drinking your orange juice and eating your muffins, he's plotting his revenge. So after the party, here's what he does. He walks to the local neighborhood banker, and he says, you know what, there's this million dollar all equity funded house in my neighborhood, will you lend me $800,000 against this house? This is where the analogy starts to break down. You tried to borrow money from a bank using your neighbor's house as backing. It usually doesn't end well. But this banker is a friendly neighbor. He says, no problem, Bob. Here, 800000 for you. Now Bob has $800,000 of money he borrowed using your house as backing. He does a hostile acquisition of your house. <clears throat> I'm not sure how this works. He approaches your kids and says, you want your own room in the basement? <laughs> Tell me you're 20. So one by one, your kids sell you out. He gets 51% of the house, he throws you out. Thank God this can't happen with the house. Now let's make this about a company. 
I have a billion dollar publicly traded company. I can afford to have 600 million in debt. I borrow nothing. You see that I borrow nothing. You try to borrow 600 million against my company from a bank. What's the bank going to say? Same thing, it's not your, no, it's, but this is where Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham changed the rules of the game in the US. What did they create, I said? See, junk, junk bonds have always existed in the US. The only problem is pre-1981, the way you became a junk <coughs> bond was you started investment grade and you slid. What he created was an original issue junk bond market. That was the Milken, Drexel. And they say, how does it help me? You need to borrow 600 million using what as collateral. You have nothing yet. You see how the junk, junk bond market allowed the first wave of hostile acquisitions in the 1980s. So what did you do? You went to the bond market, you issued $600 million worth of bonds. Using what is backing? Nothing. Unsecured bonds. They got a really low rating. But people still bought them because the interest rate on the bond was high enough. So you borrowed $600 million using my assets as indirect <coughs> or implicit collateral. You acquire my company. I'm a very conservative CEO, right? So in addition to not borrowing money, what have I very conveniently accumulated in this company for you? Cash. 400 million in cash. So right after I buy the company, what do you do? You take my 400 million in cash and pay off the $600 million you borrowed using my assets as collateral. You can't get any sweeter than this. That's what you worry about. So the question you need to ask if you have an underlevered firm is, how likely is this to happen with my company? I'm talking about the company in front of you. And there are three things at the minimum that you have to look at. The first is, if you're looking at Amazon and conclude it's under level, <coughs> do you think the potential target of a hostile acquisition? Kind of tough to come up with $300 billion, right? The first thing you look at is the size of the company. If you have 100 billion, 200, it, the level keeps rising each year, but it is more difficult to do a hostile acquisition of a bigger company than a smaller company. So the Microsoft may say it's under level, not much I can do about it. So low chance of a hostile acquisition. In the case of Microsoft, there's a second factor that's going to work against you if you try to do a hostile acquisition, and that is the insiders own shares in the company. Steve Ballmer, um, Bill Gates, they're not going to sell to you as a hostile acquirer. So it makes the game more difficult because you've got to get 51% off. 78% of the shares are up. So the lower the float, you know what I mean by float, the shares that are traded, it's more difficult. So that's the second. The third factor, and this I think is a critical one, is every hostile acquisition is a fight between two sides. On the one side is the acquirer, the other side are the managers of the firm, and for once in your life, you as shareholders in this company are the center of attention. So what do the managers tell you? Don't sell to that acquirer. He's a bad guy. He's going to ruin the company. What do the acquirers tell you? Don't trust the managers. They don't care about you. And you get to decide who to trust. Let me tip the scale a little bit. Let's assume your stock has done 80% in the last five years. Who are you likely to trust? Really? Down 80%? Why would you trust them? They're the ones who ruined your stock. Oh, up 80%. No, down 80%. You definitely will not so you see what you're going to look at? You're going to look at how well or badly your stock has done after adjusting for the market and after adjusting for risk. Is it, does that sound familiar? Adjusting. Oh, that's a Jensen's Alpha. So basically, here's your trifecta. If you're a small to mid-cap company with low insider holdings and a big negative Jensen's Alpha, and you have too little debt, don't waste your time trying to devise five-year plans. You've got to do something right away. And think of how you increase your debt ratio quickly. You borrow money and buy back stock. Debt ratio goes up right away. You borrow money and pay a special dividend. Debt ratio goes up right away. That's what a recap does. It quickly, and in fact, there was a study that looked between 88 and 93. There were 101 recapitalizations in the US. 98 of them were triggered by the threat of a hostile acquisition. So companies don't do this because, oh, I like to do a recapitalization. It's good for shareholders. They do it because they're terrified of being taken over. So that's if you're the potential target of a takeover. If that's not the case, you 
you have too much debt, but you're not in any danger of, of, you know, of being taken over. Then you can ask a follow-up question. Do I have good projects? Now, you don't want to ask managers this question, do you have good projects? The answer is, of course. You want to look at the track record of the company. And yesterday, if you remember, we came up with a way of measuring how good the existing projects of a company were by comparing the return on capital the company made to the cost of capital. I'm not saying that should be the end game, but if you have a company that has a history of taking good <coughs> projects, then you're going to cut them some slack. You say, you know what? You have excess debt capacity. Save it for the next great project, and you effectively borrow money to take projects. If you don't have good projects, then you've got to figure out a way to increase dividends and buy back stock over time. So that's the under lever. Let's go to the other, more less pleasant scenario. You have too much debt. Here, as I said, what you worry about is not being taken over. It's going back. How do you decide whether your company is under threat of bankruptcy? Let me tell you, you will know. You will know from the minute you walk into the company that's under threat of bankruptcy. Small indications. There's nobody behind the reception desk. They're gone. Remember the stock price ticker that some companies run above the reception? It's dead. Or it's stuck at zero. Because they can't go to a negative number. You go to the bathroom, there's no toilet paper. It's like a funeral home, basically. So these are companies where debt payments are really tough to make. These get into the news story. So you don't need to be a magician to figure out what's happening in your company. And if your company is under threat of bankruptcy, you've got to use the only weapon you have left, which is that you could go bankrupt. You say, how is that a weapon? What are you threatening to do? You threaten to throw yourself into the court system. So either agree to my terms, or I'll see you in bankruptcy court. And the lady says, please, please, don't go there, because once I go there, I never see. And then he says, okay. I won't go there if you will take your loan. It's a one-year loan. Make it a 10-year loan. That 10% interest rate, let's make it a 1% interest rate. Hey, would you like some equity in my company? What's the first reaction the lender says? Who want equity in a basket case like you said? You want that? You want nothing? Take a for a moment. I'll take nothing. No, I'll take the equity. It's amazing. Over centuries, <laughs> borrowers have used this capacity to lever themselves. Your bargaining power is greatest just before you tip over. And I'll tell you a story that brings home how, how much lenders are willing to bend when, you, when, when, when this problem happens. The late 1800s, I don't even know which Latin American country it was, but in Latin America, it's a history of country after country. And you look at it, 200 years of, you know, it's like Latin America is like the, the center of the world. This is one Latin American. And at that time, it was a French bank that had lent money to this country on promise and potential, silver, gold, whatever it was. Bottom falls out, the country is not able to make the payment. So the French bank called, at that time, I don't know, wireless, you know, Debt payment you pay right away. The country says, no cash, can't pay. But we can offer you something different. You know what they offered? Guano, bird droppings. They said, we can't pay in cash, but would you accept bird droppings? Bird droppings are very good fertilizer. They said, we, we'll fill like five ships of bird droppings and send them to you, send them to France. And the French bank said, no, normally we don't accept payments in bird droppings. <laughs> the country says, would you like that or would you like nothing? And the bank thought about it for a moment and said, we take the bird droppings. Now, don't try this as a strategy all the time. Okay? Now, Greece came very close to trying the strategy. It didn't work that well for them. Right? Well, why it doesn't, I was thinking of, of yeah. Greece before you mentioned Greece. Why it doesn't work in Greece? Why is this, this work? Because people are willing to push them over. They've been pushed so often. There's only so many times you can play the game, right? Okay. You remember, the 2014 episode was the fifth or the sixth time over the previous five years. And people finally said, can't get any worse. Go do the last step. Go bankrupt. Let's see what happens. So I think that they push people. You've got to be careful how you negotiate this because the lender says, OK, go bankrupt. That's it. You're done. Right? So I think that's part of the game, and some of the people who play this game, they're just playing it the way it's supposed to be played, which is the last bargaining you know, ploy you have.
<laughs> so if you're under bankruptcy threat, you've got to do something quicker. And this is where it gets difficult. And this is something I want you to think about because many commodity companies will face this question in the next next year, the next few years. You have a too high a debt ratio, everybody agrees, you have too much debt. You want to bring it down. Tell me some of the things you could do as a company to bring your debt ratio down. And I'll play devil's advocate and you can see why it's going to, every pathway is going to be wrong. What's the first thing they can do? First is they can take earnings and use it to pay down debt. The problem here is you're in trouble, you have no earnings, so that doesn't work that well. Maybe if I gave you 20 years, you could do it, but short term, it's not. How about issuing new equity? Retired debt. Well, can you imagine Glencore issuing, uh, you know, saying we're going to make a big equity issue? So you're issuing equity stuff. Okay. Sell some assets. Sell some assets. What's going to be the problem? Commodity companies. Who's going to, who are the potential buyers? Other commodity companies, and the problem is, and this is the problem, if you're going to get into trouble, you want to do it idiosyncratically. You don't want the entire sector to be in trouble because you're going to sell assets. People are saying, oh, not me, not me, you know. So selling assets because your bargaining position is short to help. There is no easy path out. It's going to, oh, every path is going to be, you're going to pick the le least pain, and that's why these restructuring talks tend to last forever. Because there is no option where everybody goes, okay, I'm happy with what happened there. So that's if you're under bankruptcy threat. If you're not under bankruptcy threat, and you can have too much debt and not be facing imminent, then you have time as your ally. And what are you going to do? Then you can use earnings. And if you do that, please stop paying dividends. You see why? If you pay dividends on one side, you have too much debt on the other, and you're trying to pay down debt, this is like fighting yourself. And this is why I brought up what BHP CFO said, and I said, this doesn't make any sense to me. The BHP. Stop paying dividends. You have a really, really good excuse, which is commodity prices have collapsed. We can't pay that. But this goes back to the me tooism, which is once you start paying dividends, it's almost like you cannot <coughs> step away from the brain. But to be practical, your valuation depends a lot on the dividends that the company not, pays. Not, not at all. My, my value as a company is never a function of the <coughs> dividends. It's a function of potential dividends. And that, there's a big difference. In cases where companies are paying out what they can afford to, the two values will converge. If you're paying out things that I know you cannot pay out, like the banks that pay out a dividend on one side and issue shares, there's going to be a divergence between the value that I attach to the company based on the potential dividends and the value. Yeah. You're saying, are there people whose values are a function of the actual dividends? Yes. That's the problem. And that's the problem. You're, you get the investors you deserve. In this case, you've attracted investors who are dividend addicts. That's basically it, right? So you've got to fix that. that. We'll talk about that when we talk about dividend changes. Yes, John? Um, ju just, just to build on that point, right. um, most investors in the market, in the equity market, are fortunately yield hungry and own dividend stocks. So there's a whole category of pension fund money that can't own stocks that don't Without pay. dividends, yeah. So yeah, as daft as it seems, if you stop paying a dividend, there will be a transition. Share price will collapse. For the moment. And that causes all of the events that you... And you know what? There is a problem, which is you have a clientele, which is a, you've accumulated over time because you have a dividend policy that they like. Mm -hmm. It is never easy to change dividend policy. Right? But there will be a point in time where you have to make a choice. Do I want to go down with my existing... The ship is going down. And uh, for me, commodity companies, this isn't a temporary problem. This yeah. is a long-term problem. I think, you're right, it's not going to be easy. Yep. But at the, sa at the same time, I don't see a choice in this for process. For them, they are so bad that it, doesn't, it shouldn't make a difference. You know what, to me, <coughs> it, uh, as, a, as an investor, it doesn't make, uh, you're right, there for some investors, for me, when a commodity company cuts its dividends now, I'm saying, thank God. They're not in denial anymore. Right? That's the reaction I have. But maybe there are a lot more people who will look at that dividend and say, that's sending a bad signal. Bad signal of what? What new newspapers have you been reading? To me, I don't need the dividend to be a signal anymore just, because I'm getting rid of it. It just creates false selling. I mean, there's, there's a bank or two. Yeah, and I, and I agree. There's, yeah. Yeah, so for example, Glencore right. becomes, it's, on the, it's on the edge and it becomes circular. It stops mm -hmm. paying dividend. The 
Shep was involved, and the whole thing is over. So you kind of did this. Yeah, so I mean, the right thing to do clearly is to cut the ribbon. Yeah. The transitions are really painful, getting from where I am to where I'd like to be. You know, and it cuts the other way too. When you increase dividends, you attract a new set of clientele with a very different set of priorities. So I'm going to talk about, when I talk about dividends, I'll talk about the Apple dividend in initiation and how it brought investors into the stock that changed the way the stock was priced. Yes? Yeah, uh, just a, a question. Yeah. Uh, when a company is facing a critical situation, right. is there um, a, a point in which you consider you do what you're desperate at this stage you will do whatever you can to stay afloat right so if, if that means factoring your receivables and getting cash for them you do it but my point is at, at whatever you get that's part of the problem right because everybody knows you're desperate when you go to do this, you're not going to get a fair, that's almost by definition, you're not going to get a fair value for whatever you do. You're going to get a discount on it because people know that you really need the cash. But that might be the best choice you have, given a lot of bad choices. And that's something, that's why I want you to think about that debt decision that you took three years ago, five years. You almost want to think through the consequences of this could happen to me. And it might not stop you from borrowing, but it might restrain you from going to that very edge, right? So take a look at your company, see if it's under levered or over levered. Take it through the process, right? Is there urgency here? 80%, I, I actually, when I work through the optimals for your 70-something companies, I think 8 out of 10 companies, at least the companies I picked, were under levered. So you have the easier problem. 2 out of 10 companies is over levered, so you have the bad problem. For the underlevered company, stop and ask, is my company the potential target of a hostile acquisition? And if you have a company that has horrible corporate governance, this process shouldn't take very long. So, for instance, an Indian paper company that you know you have absolutely no capacity to change, you're going to say, look, there's no chance of a hostile acquisition. Move on. You have the luxury of time. Think about a long-term plan. If you're over-levered, then ask, is this company potentially in trouble? In fact, go do a Google search. Company's name, bankruptcy next to it, or default, or some word. See if there are a lot of news stories that are popping up about the company and default going together. That should be the trigger. You need to do something quickly. Yeah. Which brings me to the final piece of the financing puzzle. You want to have the right kind of debt for your company. And remember what I said at, right at the start of the class. I said you want to match the debt up to the assets you have in the company. Let me give you my rationale for why this is. I have, a two, uh, I have a company here whose value goes up and down. Think of it as a commodity company or a cyclical company. In good times, the value goes up. In bad times, the value comes down. So the value goes up and down. Not because it's badly run, but just because it's a risky company. If this company goes out and borrows debt that stays fixed, no matter what happens, it's in trouble, right? Every time the value of the firm drops below the debt, technically, the company's bankrupt. So what's the big deal here? Let's assume we take the same company and it's able to borrow flexible debt. What's flexible debt? It actually goes up as the value of the firm goes up and goes down as the value of the firm goes down. It adapts to what you're doing. This second firm actually has 50% more debt than the first firm, but it never goes bankrupt. That's the essence of what we're trying to do. You, what's, the best, uh, what's the biggest advantage of debt again? Remind me. Tax. Tax advantage. What's the biggest advantage of equity? Flexibility. You know what your perfect security will look like? It'll be a cross-dressing security. It'll behave like equity around you. It'll behave like debt with the tax guy. So what you do is you get the tax benefits of debt and you get the flexibility. You think that is absurd, you can't do that. No, I'm trying. That's exactly right. That's the idea behind debt design. And in fact, I'll take you through the process of debt design using five very simple steps. So you have a business, you say, I want the perfect debt for my business. I'm going to ask you questions. Instead of you asking me questions, you have the business, I'm going to ask you questions about your business. Here's the first question I'm going to ask you. What does a typical project look like for you? So if you're Boeing, what's the answer to that? Boeing has had only nine projects in its lifetime, right? 707, 727, 737, 747, really long term. That the, if you think about the, the, the Dreamliner, you know when they started work on it? 
but 20 years ago, the first R&D started. <coughs> so it took 20 years from the R&D to a plain rolling out four years ago. And for the first four years, of course, it's problem, 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 problem. And eventually the problems get ironed out and then you get another 25 years to kind of live off that plane and then you retire. The last Boeing 747 rolled off the assembly lines 30 years after the first one did. So if you think about the collective life, you're talking about 50, 60, 70 years. So what kind of debt should Boeing take? Really long term debt. In fact, in 1999, Boeing was one of two US companies that issued 100 year corporate bonds. Think about it, 100 years. You know what the other one was? It was Disney. We'll come back and talk about it. With Disney, does it make sense? Boeing, it makes sense. If you're Google, what does a typical project look like? That's more short term, right? I mean, you're talking about two, three year turnarounds. So a typical debt for Google, if it decides to borrow money, should be much more short term. Long term or short term. Second question I want to ask you is, tell me what currency your cash flows are in. Give me a pie chart. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put up a pie chart of your debt and say, oh, do they look alike? So if you get 30% of your cash flows in euros, 20% in dollars, and 50% in reais, I want your debt to look the same. And of course, you could give me really good reasons why you're deviating. You say, you know what? Right now, I think reai debt is too high, so I've used. But I'm going to then ask you how you're protecting yourself from the fact that you have a mismatch. Because every time you have a crisis, these mismatch stories pop up, right? Of having borrowed in one currency and funded stuff in another. So that takes care of the currency. Third, if you have a choice, and Rahul says you don't have a choice in much of the world, and he says, should I be using fixed rate or floating rate debt? It's actually a very simple and intuitive way to answer the question. He said floating rate debt is tied to LIBOR, right? It goes up and down as some short term rate. It could be LIBOR, now that LIBOR is in disarray, and it could be some other short term rate. But the key to floating rate debt is, is if inflation pops up, your interest expenses are also going to pop up, inflation. So here's the question I'm going to ask you. How much pricing power do you have as a company? You see why that matters? If you have a lot of pricing power, if inflation goes up, what are you going to do? You can raise prices, you're going to push it through. So if you have floating rate debt, not a big deal. But if you don't have pricing power and you issue floating rate debt, you are going to get squeezed. You're a paper company. How much pricing power do you have? Close to zero, right? You're floating rate debt, rates go up, you can't pass it through to your customers. <coughs> it's devastating. You think I have no choice? You might have no choice, but at least be aware of if you had a choice, what you do is have less floating rate debt because you don't have pricing. But then, like, don't you think that because the fixed rate is higher than the floating? Don't. That, right now it's higher because you got an upward sloping yield curve. So I think you might be mixing up. See, fi fixed rates and floating rates, um, fixed rates are usually higher than floating rates because 90% of the time, the yield curve is upward sloping. There's no economic reason why a fixed rate always has to be higher than a floating rate. I've seen, even in my 35 years looking at the market, I know at least three times in the last 35 years where floating rates have actually been higher than fixed rates because the term structure gets downward sloping. It doesn't happen that often. So. It can happen, but it's got nothing to do with one being cheaper than the other. That's what I'm saying. It's got to do with the fact that you've got a term structure that's upward sloping, and you're taking on the reinvestment risk. That's basically what it is. It's Fourth question I'm going to ask you. How much of your value comes from existing assets and how much from growth assets? Remember that? You see, why does that matter? If the bulk of your value is coming from the future, from growth assets, it's going to tilt me away from straight debt to convertible debt. Why? Because you have a lot of growth potential. Your cash flows today are low, right? So you don't want to make big interest payments today. The advantage of convertible <laughs> debt is the coupon rate goes down, your interest payments are low. Right now you're okay, and as you grow, the convertible debt will become straight debt, kind of takes care of itself. So 90% debt design is done, right? How long term, what currency, fix the floating rate, straight or convertible. Then I'm going to get to the fun part of debt design. I know mean, you don't think of this fun. You tell me what else affects your business. So if you're a gold mining company, what's the biggest factor that drives your cash flows every year? Price. The price of gold. So if I could somehow tie your coupon payments to gold, pay, uh, gold prices, see what I'm trying to do essentially then is pass your risk through into the debt. Gold prices are high, are willing to make high payments, and 
The very first commodity bonds were actually issued by a company called Sunshine Mining, which is a gold mining company that tied the coupon <coughs> rate to the gold price. These are not free lunches. The people buying these bonds know exactly what they're buying. You're not doing it because the rate is lower. In fact, the rate might be higher because you do this. But what do you gain in return? You get that flexibility. You get to borrow more money than you otherwise would have. You default far less. So that what, that's what drives it. Instead of making cheapness the center of how you borrow money, it becomes flexibility. Excuse me. Yeah. Just a question. Yeah. the subject. Uh, when, uh, for the oil, oil company, right. now the price is down for the value of the company are down. It's down. And the cash flows are down, so you need to service the debt. So uh, I, I don't know, if maybe you are involved in, in the Aramco uh, IPO. Aramco is the, the biggest... Uh, I, we do first don't even know what it says. It's only a rumor because the Saudis play these things really close to their vest. So there's a rumor that there might be an IPO, right? Yes. Then yeah. it has been confirmed. It has been? Yes. Really? The, the, the when did that happen? The Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the fifth. When? The oh, the 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 last week I was in Dubai and there was, there was actually it's some. Last week he said on the okay. So it's, 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 it's one of the biggest companies in the world. It will be a $2 trillion dollar company. Rounds, I have too much cash. What is the point doing an IPO that the value will not be really. Why, in fact, let me ask you a question. Why are the Saudis wanting to privatize Aramco right now? Because What's it trigger? They have a budget problem. It's a budget deficit. They have 27. So the rationale for the Aramco is not because they want a market value for the company. It's really because they need the cash now and they don't want to give up control. And that's going to be the tussle because I don't I'll be quite honest, I don't think Aramco, the company, is going to be made public. I think a subset of its assets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is going to be made public because there is no way. But they would yeah. sell at very low price now. Well, they, the, the problem is they need the cash because the price is low, right? So it's a chick. They need the cash, but they have the, the government, they have five, six hundred billion. billion. Be careful. I mean, that cash. And you said, now, yeah. yesterday, last week when I was in Dubai, I, I, I valued Al Marai. Saudi, and I finished the valuation, and while I'm doing the valuation, new story comes through. You know what the new story says? This is Al Amara is one of the most highly priced you know, the food processing companies in the Middle East because it's incredibly subsidized at every level of the game. And the new story that came about was the Saudi government had pulled back on its subsidies. And that, so even though they have a lot of cash, it's also a country right now with a lot of cash outflow. If you think of it, you know, cash outflows for subsidies, uh, and so it might look like a lot of cash, but they're worried because if oil prices stay at yes, 27. So they think the oil price will not, it will, it will remain like And that's why I think, for the moment, they want to put this on the table and get things ready because if oil prices jump back to 65 next week, yes. it's off the table. Aramco is not going public. <coughs> but if it stays at 25, it drops to 20, then I think they might consider selling off pieces of the company, but still preserve the control. Right? So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. You know? But you know, I, I did see a pricing of Aramco I'll talk about later, because in a sense, we know nothing about the earnings or the cash flows. right? We, all we know is the reserves are there, and you stick your finger in the sand in Saudi Arabia, oil comes out of the ground. Those things kind of converge to create this huge value. I mean, this, the lowest cost reserves in the world. You know? So but it will be interesting to see how it gets priced up. But even if they sell the holding company, they'll only sell 20%. Yeah, but they don't even want to sell a piece of the whole. That's the pr that's I think part of the problem is they want to keep the crown jewels as completely because even if you let a 20% stake, in a sense, at least by by law, you got to have annual meetings. You got to reveal things about the whole company, and there is this air of opacity about Aramco that I think they want to preserve. So that's why I think if they do it, it'll be on a subset of the assets that they can afford to be transparent on. And you can ask all the questions you want, but everything's behind the door and that you don't get to see. That's my guess. We'll see how it plays out. Yes? I think, I think, also, I think also there is a political game. Of course. Because, you know, with the Americans living in Saudi, I think the IPO is also to attract the games in U.S. banks to lose this IPO. Because they've been really increased when I had this IPO with the American banks. So I wouldn't go there. I mean, I'm sure there are every bank in the world is lined up to do this. So I'm sure Barclays will be there. I'm sure Goldman will be there. I don't, you know, I, because, yeah, yeah. go ahead. 
Yeah, but uh, <laughs> my question is, uh, do you think that oil, gas, coal are going to still be linked in the type of pricing? Because now it's oil going down and I think it's going to stay very low. Do you think uh, gas and coal are going to be low? I think they're delinked in periods like this where you have pricing going on in the market, which is right now momentum is, oil commodities have always been momentum driven markets, which is once the mood shifts, it just, you know, it feeds on itself. And oil, the mood has just gone so off that, that people have to sell just to keep the mood. I don't think you have the same mood. Coal has never been as liquid or as priced to market. So you get these deals. But ultimately, it's energy, right? So there has to be some fundamental link somewhere that keeps them together. With the caveat that you've got green energy and the game changing out there, who knows the Tesla battery factory might be the solution to another energy problem. But I don't think they can stay delinked for a long time. But they can stay delinked enough that it can drive you bankrupt if you try to make money off that difference. Right? So first step in the process is I'm going to design the perfect model. And this is why I think companies have to take this back as their job. What I mean by that in many companies, you call in a banker. So tell me what I should borrow. This is like going in an electronic store and asking the salesman, what TV is the best one for me? You know what you're going to end up with? The 70 inch flat screen plasma TV. The fact that you have a tiny studio guy doesn't care. He's selling you the TV that he gets the biggest commission on. That's not because he's an evil person. That's his job. It's your job to measure the door in your house and the size of your room and then come to me and say, you know, this is the TV. And I think companies, in a sense, kind of abscond from that responsibility. They say, the bank is going to tell me. So that's why I don't think it's a banker's fault when you end up with these strange things. It's your fault as much as the banker's fault for letting this process become all about what did they tell me what to do. So first step, basically you designed the perfect step. Second step, what did we do in the first step? We tried to make debt that looked a lot like equity, right? That's basically what we're doing. In fact, you might have done such a good job in the first step that the tax guy looks at what you've designed and said, hey, you know what? That's not debt, that's equity. In which case, all your hard work is down the drain. So the second stuff is to make sure you haven't been too clever for your own good. So I'm going to say something nice about lawyers. This is why I need you, right? So after I've designed the security, I'm going to come into your office and say, you know what, I don't understand this tax law stuff. You seem to have a lot of tax law books on your bookshelves. Could you take a look and make sure that we passed all the... And I want to make sure that happens. And this is my last chance to kind of massage the bond, finesse it to maximize my tax benefits. Why? Because there might be big differences across regions. I might place the bond in one country rather than another to maximize my tax benefits. Step two, I pass the tax test. Step three, I have three different groups of people to keep happy, or at least two. The first is equity research analysts, and the other is the ratings agency. And they're very different interests. So when I show up in front of equity research analysts, who do I want to tell them that I'm issuing a lot of equity or a lot of debt? Generally equity, because if I, I'm sorry, generally debt, because if I issue equity, what happens? The number of shares expands, and the bogeyman comes out of the closet. You know what I'm talking about? It's called the delusion bogeyman. It's delusion. Oh my God, there's delusion. More delusion. You can't do that. So in the morning, you stop off at the Equity Research Analyst Conference and you convince them that what you're issuing next week is debt. Then in the afternoon, you visit Moody's and they're all caught up with default risk. So what do they want you to issue? They want you to issue equity. And here's the magic. You want to convince the ratings agency that the security you told the analyst was debt this morning has magically become equity. There's no chance of doing that. Let me give you an example. The security created in the early 90s called Trust Preferred Stock. I'm going to describe the security, and I'd like you to think in terms of Corporate Finance 101. Yesterday we talked about the criteria for debt, and tell me which bucket you'd put this into, debt or equity. Here's what Trust Preferred had, it a fixed dividend. <coughs> that fixed dividend happened to be tax deductible, and if you failed to make that fixed dividend payment, you'd have to give the Trust Preferred Stock orders voting rights in the company. 
it's a fixed payment tax deductible loss of control. That looks a lot like that to me. But in one of the great coups of all time, the bankers who invented trust preferred managed to convince the ratings agencies to treat it as equity. So I talked to one of the people on the panel that classifies equity and said, I never understood this classification you made. Why do you guys treat this equity? He gave me two reasons. <coughs> One incredibly stupid and one mildly stupid. <laughs> I'll give you the incredibly stupid reason first. He said, we called it equity because it was called preferred stock. <laughs> really, that's all it takes? <laughs> Let's go on a renaming convention on our balance sheet. Those corporate law bonds, we don't call them corporate bonds anymore. We call them corporate preferred stock. We don't have any bank loans. They're bank preferred stock. You, that's the incredibly stupid reason, in case you're wondering. You can't classify something as debt or equity based on what it's called. The second reason he gave me, and this is a little more subtle because banks are now playing this game, he said, trust preferred does not have a maturity debt. You see where he's going? Equity is usually the perpetual instrument, debt is usually finite life. Because there wasn't a, a maturity date, we decided to call it equity. What's the counter to that? What did I say Boeing and Disney issued in the late 90s? <coughs> Hundred year, if you bought a hundred year corporate bond, unless you're an incredibly optimistic person, you're probably not going to be around to collect the principal, right? So once it becomes hundred, why not make it five hundred or a thousand or perpetual? So in other words, what if I issued corporate bonds that were perpetual corporate bonds? In fact, the British and the Canadian governments used to issue what we call consoles. They're still around, which are forever bonds. You think, but you have to pay a higher interest rate. But remember, the rating says they're going to treat it as equity while I'm issuing bonds like crazy. I'll take the higher interest rate. Neither reason stood up, but initially, you could see what it did. What it allowed companies to do then was issue debt <coughs> and have the rating go up after the... It's like magical almost, right? You're issuing debt, you're borrowing money, getting the tax benefit. The rating says, hey, you just take him a triple A. And in fact, if you went to work for an investment bank in the early 90s, there was an incredible amount of pressure on you, as low man in the totem pole, or low woman on the totem pole, to sell as many of these trust preferred securities as you can, because the commissions were huge. Ratings agencies, as I've said earlier, are late to the party, but they eventually get there. So by the 96, 97, 98 time period, finally they were coming around to the recognition that trust preferred was not equity. It was gradual. Initially, they made it 70% equity, 30% debt, then began 50% equity, 50% debt. And finally, they said, you know what, it's more debt. We just screwed up. And guess what the next, next step here was? To create a more complex security to kind of... So the game became fooling the rating savings. That's what the game became. It's, you might have heard uh, the play Six Degrees of Separation. It's a, you know, some play on Kevin Bacon, I guess. No, this is like what, what bankers were trying to do is create degrees of separation between you and your own debt. One degree, then two degrees, then three degrees. And you keep pushing this, at the end, what do you get? You get Enron. I'm sure there are a lot of bad people at Enron, but I'm also convinced that in 1999, if you'd walked into Jeffrey Skilling's office and asked him, how much money do you owe as a company? You wouldn't have known the answer. Why? Because they done such a good job of separating themselves from their own debt that they lost track. You think that's a bad place for a company to be? Or let me raise this in a different way. I know you've heard the old thing about if you're in a forest, if a, for a tree falls in a forest and nobody hears it fall, did it fall, which I've never quite understood. So let me take that and steal it and use it anyway. If you borrow money and nobody knows you borrowed money, have you borrowed money? There's one person who knows, right? Who? The person who lent you the money and he's going to show up. So even though the rest of the world might be completely in the dark, the day of reckoning will come and say, where's my 10 billion? That's exactly the problem you create when you make this a game. This is not a game. It's not a game because ultimately if you borrow too much money, it's going to catch up with you and you have to make sure you're not violating that first principle. So now you've designed the perfect bond, you've created the tax, okay. And incidentally, I forgot to mention, there's a third group that you have to deal with if you're a regulated company, like an insurance company or a bank. 
That same security that was equity in the morning, dead in the afternoon, you've got to convince the regulatory authorities now. Tier one capital. You seen banks do this? The contortions that banks are going through to create securities that meet tier one requirements but are not equity. Right? The way that, it's just mind boggling because you gotta you, you gotta believe that this is going to blow up in somebody's face big time. Because they're adding options on top of options on top of options. Nobody can price these securities because you've added six layers of options, all of which are dependent on each other. This is asking for trouble. Why? Because you've got to meet that regulatory capital loophole. It's become fooling the regulatory guys by issuing debt and making it look like equity. Nothing good can come out of that. And finally, you got this bond, you got the tax okay, you got the different groups at least reasonably happy. You get ready to issue the debt and you discover that nobody will buy your bonds. Why? Either because you have no history in the bond market, so they're worried, or because you have a history but a bad history. So the RJR Nabisco example I gave you from 1986 where they screwed over the bondholders, they went private. <coughs> Five years later, Nabisco went back public and they tried to issue bonds. <coughs> and nobody would buy their bonds. Who can blame them? So this is the scenario where you have to sugarcoat the bonds. You have to make it acceptable to bondholders. From what? Bond owners worry that you're going to do screwy things like leverage buyouts. So this is when you start adding features like let's make the bonds portable. Let's add some options to protect. You're not doing this out of the goodness of your heart, but you're doing it because if you don't do it, you get a 15% interest rate. So you sugarcoat the bond to make it acceptable. So you got the perfect bond, you got the tax okay, you got these groups happy, you sugarcoat the bond, you get ready to issue the bond. And I'm going to take a variant of what we talked about here. You get ready to issue the bond and you discover the market is misassessing your default risk. What am I talking about? Let's say you're issuing bonds. You're, you have a bond rating. But the ratings agency have given you a triple B rating, but you feel you should have a double A rating. They've just screwed up. You see why you might want to hold back on your debt issue? Because if you issue debt right now, you're going to be paying an <coughs> interest rate much higher than you should. So what do you do? You issue bridge financing. You hope and pray that the ratings agency come to its senses. So if you're being underrated, you're going to hold back on debt. But let me ask you the more troubling question. What if you're overrated? What if you should really be triple B or single B and I'm giving you a double A rating? We talked about your... Um, now what should you do? And this, I think, and this actually you can extend it. What if my store, I mean, I've talked to technology companies, CFOs, say, can you come into my office, close the door, pull down the curtain. You know what, I think my stock is about four times higher than it should be. No, that's, it's not, he's not trying to send me a message himself. He said, should I be issuing? That would be illegal, incidentally, so don't take this to him. <laughs> Basically, his question is, should I be issuing shares like they're going out of crazy, like they're going out of stock? So GoPro at 84, let's say the CFO, the CFO called you and said, you know what, we're not worth $84 per share, it's an action camera. And Sony is making its own, and so we should really be 20, but we are at 84. So this is actually part of the same question. If the market is overrating you, either in the equity or the bond market, should you go out and take full advantage of it? Be cautious, and here's why. First, if you do take advantage and you raise all this cash, you're going to have a lot of cash you don't have a need for, right? Why do you issue the equity? Because it's... Then you're going to do stupid things with the cash. That's what cash usually leads you to do. You have lots of cash, you have nothing to do with it. You're going to do... Telecom companies in the late 90s raised equity and then said, oh, we have to do something. Let's do an acquisition. Let's do a bad project. It's got to go. But there's another more subtle problem. It's not nothing to do with morality or ethics. A year from now, assuming you're right, your stock price, goes, in the case of GoPro, it's now down to 20, you show up at the annual meeting. Okay. Now normally if your stockholders complain about the stock price going down, you say it's a market, it goes up, it goes down. But if you had issued shares at 84, you're in a much more dangerous position. Because stockholders say, you raise, these are the people you raise shares from at 84. They say, when you issue these shares, did you know? And you'd have to pay <coughs> ignorance. You know, this is a complete surprise to me. We thought we'd be at 150 by now. This is a long-term process. 
And we talked about credibility, right? You're a GoPro, the only thing you have to offer is credibility. And people start wondering whether you're trying to take advantage of them. It undercuts everything you're trying to do as a company. So I know it sounds like an, you're leaving easy money on the table. But my suggestion is if you need capital to do a project, of course you should raise the money. You can't say markets are wrong, therefore I'm, you need the money, but if you don't need the money, don't go looking for trouble. <coughs> even if the market is mispricing your debt or mispricing your equity. Professor? Yes. What's your um, thinking on subsidiaries issuing equity um, and... Are these fully owned or partially owned subsidiaries? Um, they are, they're fully, fully owned, but so, now they're going to issue... They're so gonna the, you're going to become partially companies. owned after they issue right. the equity, yeah. What's the complexities that you kind of see there? How do rating, rating agencies no. treat First, if it's equity, basically the only reason rating agencies will care is the default component, right? So if it's equity, there are good reasons for doing this and bad reasons. I'll give you a good reason. If each of your subsidiaries is in a different business in a different country, right now you're issuing shares as a holding company, so investors are really confused about what, like GE. I think GE might be better off even if they preserve their, their corporate status to let GE appliances and GE aircraft so that some of the parts I talked about, this is one way to start to unlock and say, look, people are misunderstanding us as a company. So let's let our pieces raise equity on their own. And maybe that will make it obvious that people are missing. Because what will happen is once you have a stock price for each of the subsidiaries, all people have to do is start doing the math, right? right. And they say, you know what, we're mispricing the whole. So this might be one way in which you can get that holding company discount to go away is to make it more transparent. Now let's talk about designing Disney's debt, and we'll take a 15-minute lunch break. Yeah, but, but, yeah. But sometimes this is not the, the good way to do it. I, I what, what are we talking about now? The subsidiary? About, about, no, about raising, um, raising money. Right. So, uh, I was, I'm not, I'm not special in this, I mean, I, I, I okay. work in construction, but there is a huge mega company right. that trades in the Middle East from, uh, we did not hear uh, right. about this company before, and uh, as I know the market well, I was following, this is not possible, this company is signing all the contract, all the media, all the TV, and then and when they went into the market, they raised money as a very high price, Right. And the actual shareholder say they took part of the money, they left the company, and then when the all the people discovered this company, the price This sounds like a fraud. It's a fraud, yeah. yeah. So this, I mean in a sense. You know the fraud, of course but they're this they're, is a, 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 But we're not we're not talking about GoPro <coughs> is not a fraud. I'm saying, but but the, obviously you have frauds that happen where people raise money from equity markets making promises about what they're going to do. Okay? And of course, I mean, in fact, I don't even want legitimate companies to be raising e equity when it's highly priced. But if you have a fraud, of course you're going to raise the money because you need to get out of the door as fast as you can before the fraud blows up on you, right? That's like a Ponzi scheme, basically. And it can happen. It can happen in markets. Yeah. And you know what? And if you have markets, you know what you have to say? You've got to have a regulatory framework that you can try to do that. But beyond that, you're still going to get frauds show up. And investors, you can't protect investors from their own stupidity and their own greed. Eventually, the only way investors learn not to invest in stuff like that is let them make their own mistakes and lose their money. Yeah. In terms of Disney's debt, movie business, typical movie is usually short term. Used to be primarily... US based. Now it's increasingly global. And it's movies are a very skewed distribution. You have a few really big winners and lots of losers. Last year I think the top ten movies accounted for eighty seven percent of the movie receipts of all the movies produced. You know, like hundred and fifty movies. The top ten movies. So if I were designing the perfect debt for a movie company, you know what it would look like? It would be a short term debt. Probably in a mix of currencies, depending on the franchise we're talking about. If it's Star Wars, or James Bond, it's going to be a global currency mix. And if I could, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to tie the interest payments on the <coughs> debt to how well the movie does. You say, who'd buy a bond like that? <coughs> Last week you read about David Bowie passing on, right? 
Have you heard of Bowie Bonds? In the early 1990s, David Bowie had a, pro had a fight with his record company, and he bought back the rights of all of his music, which left him with the cash flow problems. Rock star, cash flow problem don't go together. So what he did was he took all of his music, bundled it, and issued bonds against it. Now what made those bonds unique was the coupon rate and the bond was tied to how many records he sold. So if he sold five platinum records in the days before iTunes, the coupon rate was 15%. Tomorrow we all woke up and said, David Bowie, spiky hair, can't sing a song, then the coupon rate went to zero. Hey, if you can sell Bowie bonds, why can't you sell Star Wars bonds? Or Little Mermaid bonds. In fact, there are Little Mermaid bonds. Disney did issue Little Mermaid bonds. Think out of the box and make the bond market a lot more interesting. Broadcasting business, pretty short term. Right? Unless you have a show that lasts for 15, 20 years. Again, for, for Disney at least, it's still dollar driven. Because most of the broadcasting is in the US. Driven by ratings. Not bond ratings, but advertising ratings. Again, if I were designing a perfect bond for a broadcasting company, it would be tied to, to network ratings. How are you doing in this show? Theme parks are Disney's <coughs> longest term projects. Remember those 100 year bonds? This is the one business where it makes sense to take 100 year bonds. See where I'm going? If you're a multi business company asking me what's the right kind of debt for me, I'm just going to say it's going to depend on which business you're funding with that debt. Disney, each business will carry its own debt. And in fact, when I look at Disney, here's what it, I would have recommended as a generic for the collective company. I want the debt to be about 4.3 years in duration, roughly speaking. I want a significant portion of the debt to be floating rate debt. Why? Because Disney has pricing power. How do I know? Because I see the prices that I pay for Disney tickets every year. <laughs> and we know that Disney has a pretty big exposure to foreign markets, so I'd like to see a significant portion of the debt be foreign currency debt. So that's what I'd expect to see. What I actually saw was debt which was pretty close to what I'd expect in terms of duration. But far less floating rate debt and far less foreign currency debt than I'd expect to see. So what can I do? Today there are so many different ways I can fix a debt problem, right? I can swaps, derivatives. Right. 30 years ago I'd have had to pay off all the debt and replace with new debt. To me that's the biggest advantage of having access to these markets. I can fix debt problems quickly and I think for, for Disney I can either fix that or every time they take a new project I can push them in the direction. So that Shanghai Disney I would like them to borrow money in Remimbi or Yuan, that'll push other foreign currency debt. Maybe make it floating rate debt because they don't have enough of it and let that process kind of adjust the whole country. I think in emerging markets, and this I think is the last thing I want to say here about this section, in emerging markets, companies have for long been trapped by what banks will lend money at. So you could be a company with a long infrastructure project, you say, I want 30 year fixed rate debt is the right debt for me, and you go to the bank and they say, one year floating rate debt. So that's not the right debt for me, one year floating rate debt, take it or leave it. So what do you have in a lot of emerging market companies are mismatches, big mismatches in the balance sheets. To me that's, and I'm talking not about the very largest companies, I'm talking about mid cap and small companies. There is this space here for somebody who's willing to spend the resources to actually go in and try to fix these mismatches because those mismatches increase your default risk, especially during crisis. Questions? Perhaps it's a good idea then to, to make it one company, one product, create subsidiaries and to keep its ranking by guarantees of it. It the could be said. There's a reason why JVs and standalone projects, especially in big infrastructure projects, show up. Is it allows you to kind of keep all this noise to easier a minute. to sell, easier to issue exactly. bonds. Exactly. Okay, let's take our 15 minute break and then.